My name is Karen Adams, and I'm the university librarian here at the University of Manitoba. And I am delighted to welcome you to uh, this hearing by the Royal Society of Canada expert panel on the status and future of Canada's libraries and archives. It, this is an important conversation, and I'm delighted to see so many of you here. And before I introduce our panel, I thought I we, uh, many of you will have seen the invitation, which had que specific questions that we hope to talk about today. But I also thought I would remind you of the original mandate um, that the expert panel has underneath, underneath its wings, as it were. They are to investigate what services Canadians, including Aboriginal Canadians and new Canadians, are currently receiving from libraries and archives. They are to explore what Canadian society expects of libraries and archives in the 21st century. They are to identify the necessary changes in resources, structures, and competencies to ensure libraries and archives serve the Canadian public good in the 21st century. They are to listen to and consult the multiple voices that contribute to community building and memory building. They are to demonstrate how deeply the knowledge universe has been and will continue to be revolutionized by digital technology. And finally, to conceptualize the integration of the physical and the digital in library and archive spaces. We are really pleased to have with us today the chair of the expert panel, Patricia DeMares, uh, who has an impressive biography. I will, with the panelists, read the short version rather than the long version. We only have two hours. Uh, Dr. DeMares is a distinguished university professor at the University of Alberta in the Department of English and Film Studies and the Comparative L Literature Program. She's the author or editor of 17 books and over 50 articles. She has received numerous awards for her research and teaching. Her critical studies of pre-modern women writers are models of balanced investigative scholarship and her critical editions of early works for children are landmarks in the serious study of formative literary works. Recently, she has collaborated on an award-winning study, the translation and edition of a text in Cree syllabics. She's performed major service to the humanities and national scholarship as chair of her department, vice president of the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, and the first woman president of the Royal Society of Canada. Not bad. Our second panelist is, is Ernie Ingalls, um, who I know well from the University of Alberta and who is well known within the bibliographic community. We won't say a whole lot more than that. Ernie has recently retired as the Vice Provost and Chief Librarian uh, at the University of Alberta. And he has held responsibilities for the library system, museums and collections, archives and records management, the bookstore, printing and duplicating services, the University of Alberta Press, University Design Incorpor and U University Design Incorporated. He has also served as the university's CIO. He's been responsible also for administering copyright compliance, and in 2010, he was made executive professor and director of the School of Library and Information Studies. He's been an active player within library and information technology communities, having served over 100 professional associations in senior executive capacities. And I can testify to the fact that sort of his CV it takes more than one file folder to fit and uh, a small wheelbarrow to move. He's been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Ruth Cameron Medal for Librarianship, the Marie Tremaine Medal for Bibliography, the Canadian Association of College and University Libraries Award for Outstanding Librarian, the Innovation Achievement Award from the Canadian Association of College and University Libraries, the President's Award for Outstanding Service from the Library Association of Alberta, and Outstanding Alumni Award from UBC as well as outstanding alumni honorary from the University of Alberta, Innovator of the Year and Hall of Fame inductee award sponsored jointly by Canadian Business, the Royal Bank, SIPS, and the Information Technology Association of Canada. He's also received the Outstanding Service to Librarianship Award from the Canadian Library Association and is an honorary life member of the Alberta Library. In 2001, he was a specially elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and in 2003 was awarded the Queen's Jubilee Medal and in 2012, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal. Please join me in welcoming our panel. And they are joined at the table by Jessica, 
Nick uh, McQueen, their research assistant from the, also from the University of Alberta. Uh, I will remind you there was a notice at, uh, again about filming and I think many of you have now signed documents giving your permission to be filmed. My understanding is the only thing that the material will be used for is to support the work of the panel and uh, I don't think there's any news media president, but hi hypothetic way for, for, for news coverage. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the panel uh, to, to get us into our proceedings. Thank you very much. Um, is this, this is working, isn't it? Oh, wonderful, okay. Um, good afternoon. Um, Ernie and Jessica and I are overjoyed to see so many people here. Um, since you've heard about us and we don't know about you, we would really like you to introduce yourselves. Let me just bring you up to date. Um, Karen has kindly uh, reminded you all of our mandate, maybe reminded us of our mandate too. Um, and I'll tell you what um, the panelist has been doing and um, who the other members of the panel are. We are an 11-person international panel and these are our members. Guillaume Baudry, who is interim director of the libraries at Concordia. Pam Bjornsson, who is Executive Director at the National Research Council Science Library. Michael Carroll, a professor at the University of Washington, who was one of the founders of Creative Commons. Um, Carol Couture, Professor of Archivistics at the Université de Montréal. Um, Charlotte Gray, um, biographer, historian, prize-winning author. Judith Hare, recently retired head librarian at the Halifax Public Library, Ernie Ingalls, whom you've met, uh, Eric Ketelar, who is um, the former chief archivist of the Netherlands and professor of archivistics, uh, Gerald McMaster, who has been the curator of Aboriginal art at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and Ken Roberts, former president of the um, uh, Canadian Urban Libraries Council and former chief librarian of the Hamilton Public Library. So we are a combination of archivists and librarians um, with an <coughs> English professor thrown into the mix um, who happens to use a lot of libraries. Um, I will tell you that we have to date conducted consultations in Yellowknife and in Vancouver and in Ottawa and um, there are many emerging themes in our conversations. I'd like to hear from many of you, as many of you as possible this afternoon, about your view of libraries and archives and why, why they are important, why they're central to your work. Uh, the first question that we ask, actually, is how would you describe the services Canadians, including Aboriginal Canadians and New Canadians, are currently receiving from libraries and archives in Canada? And when we asked this question at Aurora College in Yellowknife, um, there were, I suppose, about 35 <coughs> students in the room for a noontime meeting. And we heard such things as, the library is where you go to learn about learning. The library protects democracy. The library is the hub of the community. The library is where I learn to think. Now, these are, these are the statements of um, students who are in programs of social work, nursing, and education at Aurora College. Many of them as, well, quite a few of them actually, as single parents who are undertaking this uh, post-secondary education. It was really a remarkable um, session that we started with in Yellowknife, and I'm still grateful to our colleagues at Aurora College for organizing it. I'm also grateful to Shelley and Karen for assembling this wonderful group this afternoon. So let me hear from some of you, if you'd like to start off, students, professors, um, uh, archivists, telling us what is important for you, what value do you place on libraries and archives. We have people here I know from the museum, both from the Museum of Human Rights, but also from the Hudson's Bay Company archives. We have such a diverse collection here today that I'd really love to hear from some people. So I'm going to stop talking and start listening to you about why libraries and archives matter. Who would like to start off? Oh, and maybe people are going to run around with, um, okay, oh, wonderful, okay. <laughs> I did that at Simon Fraser University and ran myself to the ground, but. Hello. Oh yes, it's working. <laughs> So you, you have um, the opportunity for not only um, 
disquisition but amplification. So please, what do libraries mean? Why do libraries and archives matter? And please, just don't tell me it's a motherhood statement. No, why do libraries and archives matter? What are they? What special services do they offer? Are there things that libraries do now that they haven't done in the past? Shelley. No, no, uh, the, night, the mic will come to you. I'll, I'll pass it on to you after. Um, well, I just say that, uh, um, that archives, uh, sorry, Shelley, yes. Sweeney, um, that archives are really uh, critical for the transmission of knowledge. Um, that uh, with, without um, the records that archives are entrusted with by society, mm -hmm. uh, there would be no, no sources for um, either the, the preservation of cultural knowledge as well as um, the protection of individual human rights uh, the accountability and transparency of government, mm -hmm. and um, the, the, uh, also the, the integration of um, uh, ethnic identity and Canadian identity, uh, the support of Indigenous, um, well, Indigenous rights, but also uh, Indigenous identity um, as much as, as, uh, as possible. Thank you. That's a very strong opening for us. Um, and after this person has spoken, they won't go to the back. Yes. Cynthia Dietz. I want to say that um, the libraries and archives, in some cases, have a very deep collection of aerial imagery. They have an opportunity to share a lot of satellite imagery. In the time when we're going through uh, enormous climate change, yeah. uh, the permafrost is thawing. Uh, there's there's a, a need to analyze it and to uh, sort of figure out changes over time. Mm -hmm. There's an enormous opportunity for people who live in the north to help with this. Thank you very much. If you would pass it to the woman at the back. Thank you. Uh, libraries mean a lot, particularly to get to know about Canada. Mm -hmm. Many new Canadians have expressed the fact that they can just walk into a library our archives, they may not know the distinction as much as that, but they know. If they just want to know more about Canada, wherever they are, or just about the weather, how to cope with the weather, anything <laughs> at all, their first place that they can go to without worrying, can they walk in? That's a big step that they first take, uh -huh. and that's quite often the library. Thank you very much. We've heard that um, opinion expressed in different ways and in very moving ways when we met with the um, directors of BC Public Libraries in Vancouver, they told us that the library was not only the hub of their community, it was the information center of their community. It's where newcomers first arrived. It's where they came to orient themselves within the community. So this is, a, this is a, not only a valuable, it's um, an absolutely crucial, I think, um, role of the library. Yes, please, um, if we could have the mic then passed to the fellow there. Yes, I'm sorry, I've forgotten names, and you're going to have to introduce yourself again. I'm uh, Philip Wolfart. I'm with Volunteer Manitoba. Okay. And uh, the, the thing that and I do next. at Volunteer Manitoba next. is I manage a, a database of about 5,000 nonprofit organizations in Manitoba. Mm -hmm. And uh, they these organizations rely extremely heavily on libraries to do their research and to do their work and to provide services to uh, Aboriginal Canadians, to new Canadians, to mm -hmm. seniors, to young people, mm -hmm. and they all rely very heavily on libraries of a variety of kind. Uh, I'd like to stress also that of about those five and a half, five thousand organizations, about 400 actually have the word library somewhere in the description, so they actually have special library collections, for example, the Addictions Foundation of Manitoba mm -hmm. has a special library. The um, uh, Regiment Museum in Brandon has a special library. Mm -hmm. The Aboriginal Literacy Foundation has a special library. So there are hundreds of small libraries, very special collections that uh, are incredibly value in, valuable in building a community and definitely need to be protected and definitely need to, need to be brought into this uh, discussion about libraries. 
both how they use them and the fact that they have libraries of their own. Yes, thank you, Philip. You wanted to add something? Um, add and uh, perhaps ask a question generally, perhaps to this gentleman, but to anybody else who wishes to answer. Um, the, the, the statement that you just made again, and uh, this is not meaning to, uh, to uh, say anything against what you said, uh, we have heard before that there are many uh, small libraries, small archives, uh, providing valuable services, doing uh, yeoman's work in a variety of communities uh, in all of the areas that we've, we've been to thus far. Uh, yet, when we pull someone from outside of that area, they don't know anything about what's happening. Um, I guess perhaps it's a statement I'm making, but I'd like to get a bit of a, a, a comment from people. It appears to me, at least, that neither libraries or archives are telling a very good story because they don't seem to be having any impact beyond a very narrow focus of perhaps of even a very narrow client focus uh, that, they're, that they're using their collections. There are so many wonderful stories out there. In fact, I said to our chair at one point, perhaps the best thing that could come out of this, this consultation, uh, we, should, we should entitle our, our book or our report, The Royal Society Tells the Library and Archives Story because the libraries and archives aren't doing a very good job of it. So that's my point back to you. Do you think libraries and archives are doing a very good job telling the kind of story about the rich kinds of collections and the services that they offer? I don't know whether you have a response to that, Philip, but I have two speakers who want to add to it. Oh, all right, I have three. <laughs> Hello, uh, Michael Dudley, University of Winnipeg. Uh, a couple years ago, I also edited a, a book for the American Library Association, ALA Editions, uh, called Public Libraries and Resilient Cities. And uh, it's a collection of, of stories, as, as you were just saying, um, library professionals telling their stories about, about how their libraries contributed to their communities and the ability of their communities to address the various challenges that they were facing. Uh, and so I'm, I'm particularly uh, concerned about, about telling that story about how important libraries are uh, one of the first statements we heard today was about how important they are for democracy, and there's a lot of different ways that that works. And uh, one, of course, is the ability of, of, of citizens to, to be informed, to be educated, to, to learn, to come together, to engage in dialogue about the issues that they might be facing in their communities, but also the fact that libraries and archives preserve information, they gather information, they make it available to researchers <coughs> to support evidence-based policy making which is really facing a crisis in this country because so many of these libraries are having their funding cut or are being shuttered and are not able to support the, and, and to help disseminate the, the knowledge, the research that scientists and other policy-oriented uh, researchers are creating to help inform evidence-based policy making uh, at, at a governmental level. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we, that we uh, support libraries uh, for that reason because they have a, a, a vital role to play in, in democracy from everything from, from uh, the grassroots level up to the making of policy. Thanks. Thank you. I think this woman here in the front is next and then your turn. Andrea Schweitzer, clinical librarian, the University of Manitoba. Um, Libraries are the hidden foundational stone of the um, commerce and um, economics health of this country. And it is also the cornerstone of health in this country. And are we telling our story um, as well as we could? Absolutely not, we're not. Um, I'll just quickly give a, a case study. Um, I am a, a member of a multidisciplinary um, team, research team, uh, looking at um, the establishment of um, peer-led health community groups across different areas in um, socioeconomically challenged areas of Winnipeg. This is part of an international and um, interprovincial program project. And um, always, <laughs> I have to rem remind the committee when they're talking about promoting these committees, the services that they're, they're wanting to, to establish, these, these, these um, 
meeting groups that they're trying to develop effectively are to promote health literacy and, and, and wellness strategies within that group to um, cut um, costs in regards to uh, chronic disease prevention and, and uh, better access to, to health services in, in, in Winnipeg. And they're always trying to figure out how to recruit, how to sustain these groups. And I have to remind them that libraries are a key resource that they can use. There are spaces available for them to book. There are um, resources. Librarians are more than happy to, to develop and, and, and be um, facilitators or, or information providers to these groups. Um, I'm not necessarily, they have taken me up on some of that, more for their own educational purposes than that of the, 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 the various different com community groups. I think they're a little bit worried about imposing themselves on these groups. But the fact remains, um, I'm not sure how to change that in terms of, of, of getting the, our stories out there to encourage the uptake of the wealth of resources that both public and health libraries and other libraries have. Um, but we do have an essential service, especially in the state and age of digital um, access, um, of not only education, but actually preventing harm. Health literacy has been recognized in this country through an um, uh, intersectorial document that was published at the uh, Canadian Public Health Agency, um, where it was recognized that libraries are one of the crucial members of intersectorial partners. And, and this needs to be recognized and told and reminded to the ministers of health what we do for health and how we impact the bottom line of health in this country. Thank you, Andrea. The next one, please. Uh, Ada Dukas. Um, I think two adjectives that I would use to describe libraries are our safe ground and neutral ground. Mm -hmm. Anybody can walk into any library and feel that they're not gonna be judged, they're gonna be safe. And I say this as a health librarian with an Aboriginal health collection in my library, an archives and a consumer health collection. It is amazing sometimes what consumers will say to the reference librarians at the desk. And you know, you have to hold them back and say, we're not here to give medical advice or anything <laughs> like that. But I think it just speaks to something else that libraries are besides you know, uh, uh, helping evidence-based, uh, yeah. make evidence-based decisions. So I think that's um, something I would say. Uh, when it comes to promotion, we are terrible at promotion. And I think it's because a lot of times libraries are built for just in case, but people only want you just in time. They only maybe think of libraries when they really need them. And it's very difficult to get the message out uh, people are bombarded by so much information, so much coming at them that, you know, we're constantly sending out emails. We've got this new product. We've got something else. But it's only when they come into the library that they need help with something that all of a sudden you show it to them and they know. So I, I, I think part of it, I mean, there are wonderful libraries, like Philip said, but it's very difficult. We should learn to market and not, because promotion is definitely not working for us. Thank you. Um, Andrea and Ada and Philip have drawn our attention to the need to um, encourage what Andrea said was uptake of this wealthy resource of libraries and archives. Since we have such a collection of students in the room, students in first and second year of their library and archive studies or history studies, I'd be interested in hearing from you about any ideas, any suggestions that you might offer to us of ways of encouraging this public uptake and a more general championing awareness of what it is that libraries have and offer, archives as well. So would any students like to contribute to the discussion? No pressure, but I'm just looking exactly at you. So anything? I think that anybody that wears purple <laughs> has something to say. <laughs> Some have that glory thrust upon them, so there you are. <laughs> and you won't be the only one this afternoon. Any ideas for how we can get 
how we can get the news out, the good news out about libraries and archives? I don't know, I think the key is probably just taking advantage of current like social media and yes. other like newspapers and other kind of older forms of media and just mm -hmm. in, like publicizing it more mm -hmm. commonly. Well, we, we heard in, in Yellowknife that there, and even in Vancouver, that there used to be um, 15 minute or half hour spots on CBC where a librarian would offer a series of reviews of books, of current books in the library in a whole range of disciplines. Um, it's old media perhaps, but it still reaches a lot of listeners. Anyone else want to contribute? Yes, please. And we're going to give you the microphone at the back. Yes, right next to the projector. Thanks. I think having just come Could from Could you a, identify yourself? Oh, I'm Elizabeth Ann Johnson, um, okay. second year archival study student. I just came from a class this morning in which one of my classmates, who is, you know, a young white PhD student with all of the privileges that she had, that she has, and she was saying that she had no, like she was scared to come into the archives because it was too intimidating. And like I've worked in this archives. I know that we have a video like, like showing people how to use the archives well. And she did not find that on the archives website. So I think maybe being more proactive in the way that we present ourselves to like even as small a population as the university population, like grad students shouldn't be scared of going to the archives. Oh, no. Like at the very <laughs> bottom line, like that should be a given that those people feel welcome. So I think we have a long yes. way to go in making ourselves. So you're suggesting that some of these uh, media need to be made more user friendly? Or just more accessible. More like, accessible. Like, like put them more in people's faces. Mm -hmm. Like people don't want to click through a bunch of pages to find something welcoming them to the archives and kind of demystifying the whole process. Because after all, when they Google, it jumps right to the top of the page, doesn't it? And they get exactly what they want in, in a split second time. So of course, that's exactly this, how it works. It's this kind of immediate service that, um, that could help to focus the search. Definitely. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's the way it is. And I think that we need to adapt to that. Great. Thanks. Paul, I think you're next. So Brett, are you, are you listening to this? Shelley's a pretty scary person. <laughs> Full of fear when approaching the, the archives. Oh, yes. Paul Dick from CMU. Uh, the, the counterpoint that, that raises for me, though, is that there's a kind of mystique to the library that, uh, I mean, if you think where the Harry Potter books, uh, you know, have their energy around, it's in that area, the restricted section, right? So there is a funny kind of paradox there. That goes along with the paradox of you know making uh, books available, but also the need to preserve, yeah. right? And so, I don't know that that there's any real suggestion here, other than that the allure of the library has to do also with its kind of hiddenness or the, the its strangeness. Yeah. Simply making it into something entirely open, or, or tr trying to make it so democratic, mm -hmm. uh, well, has the risk of making it bland. Yes. Uh, so uh, we don't want it to lose its allure in the process. That's right. right. Okay, I, I, I take your point. Ernie. Um, yes, and this falls into the category of others with purple <laughs> attire, um, but it's CMU. Um, we've heard from many um, more, and I guess I should also say that I've taken the, the position on this panel of being self-identified agent provocateur. So sometimes what I say and what I ask isn't necessarily what I mean, just so you understand that. But we have heard from some that the, I'm gonna focus on academic libraries, uh, college university libraries will be, are dead, dying. They'll be gone within five years, replaced with uh, digital resources, electronic databases, um, created by um, uh, supply services, people who just license things and make them available across the campus for the benefit of everybody. And there is a view amongst uh, many that that is, and we've heard it, that that is what's going to happen. Yet I hear that CMU has decided that a library is important to what is a university or what is a college, what is a campus, and that it has not only in, in not only information knowledge value, but iconic value as well. So I'd like to probe that a little bit, and uh, I'm sure CMU had all sorts of things it could have spent its money on. 
why is it going to be spending probably a considerable amount of money for, for your university on the library? All right, uh, and then we'll return to the um, academic VP. We'll, we'll and then we'll, we'll take your comment. Okay. The, um, it strikes me that, that the, the library, um, university libraries are, um, are a place um, of discovery. Increasingly, they're, increasingly they're, they're places not only for discovery and study, but places for conversation about, about life of the mind, about, about um, about a body of literature that pertains to person's uh, discipline and interest. Um, and uh, there continues to be something um, altogether wonderful about the opportunity that exists to, to roam about in the stacks and discover those things that you would not have discovered um, otherwise. Um, but it seems to me that, that um, the, the opportunity it provides for a physical locatedness for persons to work um, on scholarly project, to engage in conversations that, uh, that are sometimes um, happenstance, uh, that there's much about that that cultivates this, this sense of of, of wonder and joy, this cherishing of text, this cherishing of a process of engagement with text um, that the physical space is able to engender in particular and marvelous ways. So for many of us, um, we, we grew up in worlds where, where libraries were places to be inhabited precisely because they were places that enabled us to cultivate this sense of wonder that there was in the engagement of the world of the text. Um, it seems to me that that is as significant an issue in the 21st century um, as it was in the, in the 12th century. Thank you. While we're passing the mic, oh, I don't know if Paul wanted to say no, something. I, no, I think it's... No. Uh, while we're passing the mic, let me just say, good answer. Uh, that was... Uh, <laughs> That was very, very good, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I think that, that was a superb answer. The other thing that we have heard as well, and now we're, I guess I'm feeding things back, is that it's one of the few places on a campus where the various disciplines can come together that they're not in their silos with the science people over here and the arts people over there and the agricultural people here and everybody, that there's something that's a gathering place. It was also pointed out to us, and I don't know if this is true or not, Karen is the master of all things, knowledge about libraries, uh, that actually 30 to 40 percent of college students meet their spouse in the library. So <laughs> that uh, seemed to me a pretty good way to thing to do anyway. We have a comment. Yes, please. Uh, I'm Heidi Reese. Um, I want to start off by, I work in a government library um, that has closed stacks, which probably is very different to, for, from a lot of people's experience of libraries. But I want to start by talk, uh, mentioning briefly that um, there is, in a, and for good reasons, and, and it's a good thing, a big difference between libraries and archives. And I think that sometimes by lumping them together um, is detrimental to the, uh, the, the work of each uh, type of um, repository. And I think there's also a big difference between uh, so many libraries, like a, a small volunteer library, um, my government library, that it's a mandate to collect government information, um, uh, does not lend to the general public, has a very different um, mandate and a very different uh, set of requirements and needs than a uh, university library. And um, I think that, um, you know, we're all going to agree, and I'm sure you're going to you've heard this and we'll hear this again and again, how everything that we do is great, um, but everything that we do is so different. Um, I think it, 
it's a really difficult challenge to say, uh, this is what a policy should be, this is what um, you know, everyone should think about as they're uh, going forward looking for funding, looking for um, a reinvigorated staffing, um, even in terms of uh, directing students um, in terms of their education. So um, I, I think it's, I, some of the questions to me, I, I, I looked at them and I said, wow, we're gonna be all ministers preaching to the choir and then the choir members are gonna be preaching to each other and then we're all gonna go off to preach to theology students at the theology college. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean, I think it's great that there's a huge interest in libraries and in archives and all the different things that they all do. Um, but in the end, we all have such different goals, um, you know, when it comes to, you know, the foot soldiers on the front lines, that it, it's, it's a very difficult challenge to find um, consistency, you know, even within this room, let alone across the country. You raise a very good point, Ida, thank you. Um, and Although um, I do want us to discuss some of the distinctions between libraries and archives, and we have both librarians and archivists and archive students in the room today, I, I do want to backtrack a little and to say something about the, um, the backstory of the mandate of this panel. Um, while we were not um, formed to respond directly to the situation which became a critical situation at LAC, LACBAC, Library and Archives Canada, um, we are certainly concerned about that situation. And I think um, everyone with an interest in libraries would naturally be concerned uh, with, the, um, with the dismissal of one head or the removal of one head, an interim um, librarian and archivist, and a headhunting firm run search for a replacement. Um, as you know, the librarian and archivist communities across Canada provided a very detailed, excellent profile of the characteristics that they would expect in the next librarian and or archivist of Canada, the person who fills that role. And I guess really my first question for you is, and it's a question that I know Ernie is eager to hear an answer for as well. Do you think that the current situation at LAC is a workable situation? A situation of forced marriage, some people call it, as of the LAC Act of 2004, where libraries and archives were brought together. Should this situation of the marriage be continued? Should there be an amicable or not so amicable divorce between the two? Or should there be some new formation where Libraries and Archives Canada worked under the aegis of museums? Okay, we have some answers to that. Uh, Ada. Ada. Um, I was on the SISTI. What's happened to our, yes, okay. Yes, I was on the SISTI advisory board at the time when Ian Wilson and Rock Carrier had their meetings and they decided, one of the reasons that they decided that LAC should be formed was that as um, separate archives and libraries, they were two small organizations within the government of Canada. Mm -hmm. So by joining together, they felt they would be a medium-sized organization and it would give them uh, more leverage. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I think that was the reason that it was formed. Mm -hmm. How um, does that work for them? Well, <laughs> now having, as I said before, I have an archives in the Health Sciences Library, and I see that more and more libraries and archives are going to be inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. Past information, current information, a lot of it is digital. I think the, the digital future is huge. So why separate them? Uh, I, I just look at the work that we do, people come in for uh, the Faculty of Medicine, they come in for current information and then they come in for us to help them with their history of a department or something like that. So mm -hmm. I, I think separating them, I don't see a future in that. But when we consider the comments of our, our last speaker that 
on the ground, on the front level, their roles are essentially different, according to the earlier speaker. You're saying that they're inextricably linked and they will become more and more intertwined as we continue in this digital future. I, I think so. I really I think so. I mean, my archivist sits at the reference desk. Mm -hmm. He attends the meetings and I think, you know, when we want records from mm -hmm. Mac, we might want our ancestral records or our historical records. We might want current literature. Mm -hmm. One stop shopping is really nice. Mm -hmm. We heard One, about, oh, sorry, oh. sorry, Ernie, we heard about a, um, an initiative at the Simon Fraser Library uh, where an archivist is actually employed in special collections now. And the presence of the archivist in special collections has really been a boon to the researchers working there. That's one view. But I would like to hear from other people in the room. Uh, there's a hand up at the back. OK. Ganga Dakshinamurti. I certainly there's a case can be made for bringing uh, all materials to users' attention. Quite often, if they don't use ar archives or any such material, it could be because their mind had not opened up to that. Mm -hmm. So some way bringing the attention to all that we have, archival material and library, print, electronic, all of that, I agree with the Ada, the more and more, uh, if the usage is needed, then we have to direct their attention. But once they know the value of that, they are not considering from where it is getting, so long as they have it. I think we should do that so that we can stand together. And Ernie has a comment, and then I'd like to hear from the person in this row and the gentleman there. Yeah, maybe just to um, uh, add, add some dexter to what uh, Pat was saying. One of the things that we've been hearing in, in, in everywhere is exactly what, what you guys were, were just talking about, this, this convergence, particularly uh, when it, it, it is at the interface uh, between a, a client a, uh, and, and the, the repository. That seems to be clear. But what we're also hearing is that the professions of librarianship and the professions of archival science are not being well represented and should have their iconic heads. And that was why there was some discussion about whether or not there should be two individuals. The collections, the services, the administrative elements of LAC all could still kind of remain a kind of a common a, a common infrastructure and pool. But are the professions being served by one individual who is either an archivist, a librarian, or in the last little while, neither, none of the above. So that was the conversation that's been happening elsewhere, and I'd like to you know, perhaps get your views and opinions on that as well, but we can. She kind of answered my question. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> um, I'm Dana Slesser. I'm a MA in archival studies as well. I'm kind of, a, as I'm one of the people, many of whom in this room are going to be entering the job market. Uh, I'm kind of looking at it as if we start the fight between who gets what out of library and archives, we're taking away from the funding and a lot of what this is, to me anyway, the discussion is about where this funding is coming from and where we're going in the future. So I was, I, I kind of, before you spoke, sorry, but was basically thinking, why are we fighting over who gets what pie? Can't we just say we're all information managers but are in step, like we're doing different things but how can we work together? I don't understand why we have to kill ourselves over this when there is so little funding as there is already. If you were, for example, to split up LAC, how much time, cost, and realistically, how many jobs are going to get lost in that? Just I'll, as. All right, you've asked a question, and I'd like to hear from two more speakers before we um, maybe together provide some answers. Yes, please. Uh, and, and let's Hi, wait I'm until Barry you get Ferguson. The, we're I'm going to give you the microphone, though. It's the because they're recording. The issue of organization seems to me to be a you know, parallax view, close one eye, close the other. Um, if you asked specifically about Library and Archives Canada, I believe, yeah. and, you know, okay, it seemed to me the reorganization of 2004 was kind of a, what, 40-year recognition mm -hmm. of the forced um, integration of, into one building of two separate organizations. Um, from the perspective of an archives user. Um, at that special archives, um, the fact that the archival materials aren't housed in the building, but rather in a separate storage site that requires well, basically days uh, notice in advance. 
um, in the situation of a special national archives that really should, it seems to me, to be open to all of us from all across the country, whether we're privileged academics or uh, people doing human rights research is a, is a really important issue. Um, so that the, the special function of a national archives I think really has to be recognized. I don't know whether there can be a single boss or not, um, but the archives, uh, it seems to me, has to be a single entity. The li National Library is great too. I use that from time to time. Um, but, you know, we, we had a problem of what, 40 years or 50 years of, of uh, uh, makeshift operation that then ended up being, being an integration. And I'm not going to go on and talk about some of the problems of deteriorating services just yet. Um, but I, I do think that these are special, separate functions. Special, separate functions that require um, specific, specific accessibility. And specific individuals to head them with um, uh, separate, specific uh, responsibilities. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Karen. Karen Adams. Uh, Barry was on my hiring committee. You're going to be sorry. <laughs> One of the things that I think we do share in common, having heard th that we don't share much in common, is access and preservation. We both do this. And in the digital environment, the, um, the difference between published and unpublished in the digital environment is a kind of, huh? Uh, it, it's not the same as it was in the paper world. Um, it, it, poses a different set of challenges, whether it's published or unpublished, to have digital materials to preserve and provide access to. Uh, but but I, I, I think the distinction that we've long held and loved is, is between published and unpublished isn't going to serve us well moving into the future. And whether we should have a librarian or whether we should have an archivist, um, I don't have a strong view. What we should have, though, is someone with skills related to change management and someone uh, with an understanding of the current information environment, however they have gained that, and someone who can work successfully within their bureaucracy and get some money. We've had some great heads, I know, of, of, of the old National Library who weren't librarians, but, but understood the system and how to work within it and, and, and get us the programs that we needed and who had the kinds of leadership skills that um, leadership. In, in the library community for quite a long time, what would happen was there would be a problem identified within the community. And in those days, the National Library wouldn't fix it or pay for it, but they would bring the right players into, the, into, the, into a space to discuss the solution. And then they wouldn't fund the solution necessarily either. They'd leave us to figure that part out too. But there, that's part of the role we're missing now is, is for example, we're talking about last copy paper in Western Canada across the universities. Yes. Well, this shouldn't be across the Western universities. It should be across the country. Mm -hmm. But that, that role that, that gets us all talking nationally between public libraries, between academic libraries, between school libraries, for that matter, mm -hmm. is now lacking. Yes. Uh, so that, uh, that, that's my comment on... on, uh, on archivist versus librarian versus separate institutions. Okay, thank you very much. I see three hands and I'd like to acknowledge them. One, Andrea, the woman in the purple sweater, and Tom. Um, just following up on Karen and uh, the gentleman before her's point, um, I know that among my colleagues, um, the <coughs> head that we would like for LAC would be that very person that Karen had indicated in terms of the qualities, but um, in addition to those qualities, someone who recognizes the professionalism of both a librarian and archivist, celebrates that professionalism, creates synergies between that, those professions, and, and finally um, promotes and encourages the two professions to tell their stories to one another. Because it seems to me that going through um, library school I wasn't told what an archivist did. I just knew what a librarian was supposed to do. 
And it wasn't only until after I graduated and came and, and, and encountered archivists that I actually had some sense of what they did and how they contributed to me and my profession. So, you know, uh, Mr. Inglis was saying, do we tell our story well to others? No, we don't. Do we tell our stories well to each other? No, we don't. We need to fix that. Thank you. Yes, Terry Riley, I want to pick up on Ernie's uh, nod to the museum world and questions around convergence. I worked for some time, as many of you know, at the University of Calgary, where we worked in a co we're working towards a converged model of libraries, archives, and museums within the university library. It's not an easy road um, and tends often to be driven more by, by financial exigency than uh, intellectual, um, intellectual creativity. Um, but I think that it would be wrong if we moved into the next, uh, the next round of who is going to head LAC without taking a serious look at museum curatorship and how the artifactual world, especially in its digital um, output, is going to impact knowledge-based knowledge learning in the next little while. Our kids and our grandkids think in 3D. We didn't, but they do. And so um, in a world where uh, games are high intellectual activity, we've got to get serious about relating to the museum sector. Now, whether that means convergence at a national level with national institutions, I'm really skeptical after my experience at Calgary, but I think we have to at least acknowledge that the people that are coming to our archives are coming with a 3D mindset now, and they have to, they have to, their expectations have to be met somehow. Thanks. Thank you. Tom, I think you're next. Yeah, Tom Nesmith. Um, well, anybody who knows me well knows that I think there is a distinction between a librarian <laughs> and an archivist. Um, and in a nutshell, um, I think that the archivist needs to apply and understand a range of contextual information about the records that is different from the range of contextual information that a librarian needs to employ. Um, also, and I think that you can see this happening in uh, the, the different work of, that they do in regard to choosing what should be in the library and choosing what should be in the archives. If we have a thousand feet of government records to be analyzed for and appraised for that portion that should come into the archives and a thousand publications, I find it hard to uh, think that the decision-making process, the approach to it, the thinking behind it, the criteria that are used, just the same, just because we select things. You know, librarians select, archivists select things. I think that there's a depth of difference in the approach that's really important, and that applies also to the description of those records. 500 feet of records in a particular font, to use that funny word that everybody wonders the meaning of, um, the description of that is different from the description of 500 books. The description of that 500 feet has to be far more contextual than the description of 500 books. Uh, yes, there's contextual information for the 500 books, but it's different. And the reference services that falls out of that is also different. When you're talking about access to 45 kilometers of archives at the Archives of Manitoba, or nearly 200 kilometers of archives at the National Archives, and these are not the biggest archives in the world by a long shot. We're not talking about the same sort of activity, really, although there is a similarity. And the digital, common digital nature of things does not really fundamentally change that because the form of the digital material and communication remains roughly the same, mm -hmm. even though it's in a common digital format. Anyway, uh, this means that I, of course, was never in favor of the merger of the library and National Library and National Archives. I think that, uh, and after nearly a decade of the attempt to make something of this merger, very, there's very little to show for it. The question now is, of course, as you say, should we uh, dismantle this? <laughs> I'm not absolutely sure about this because I think that there are ways in which there are kind of merged library and archive services. Yes. This library has an archives in it. Mm -hmm. It works well. There is a kind of merger of sorts, but this merger, it seems to me, is one that respects those distinctives very, very much. Yeah. That's the key. Yeah. It's not a matter of what structure is going to work. Mm -hmm. 
the LAC merged the library and an archives. Well, why didn't it merge the museum? Why didn't it merge with the National Gallery? Why didn't it merge with Parks Canada? Why didn't it merge with other archives? I mean, the possible structural mergers are in endless and never going to satisfy mm -hmm. the, the need. But in the digital age, maybe we have a chance to get past this old, old think question yeah. about structural mergers, because the linkages that are possible between all sorts of institutions are now extraordinary. You really don't have to merge with anybody, you can just link with them. Yes. Collaboration, it seems mm -hmm. to me, is the key. Not mergers, especially if they're thought of loosely as thoroughgoing amalgamations of two distinctive functions yes. into one common thing, yes. which I think reduces the whole thing to a lower level of common, uh, a low common denominator, and all services suffer. I could go on. But. Thank you. Thank, no, thank you, Tom, because um, what you say resonates with um, many of the comments that I've heard from a fellow panelist, Carol Couture, um, who, um, instead of using the term integration, uses the term harmonisation um, of archival and library studies. And he's talking about the success of Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales du Québec, Banque, uh, which is a success because it is a creative coexistence, a coexistence that recognizes the distinctness of each of the partners. Um, I'm wondering if students and um, those involved in directing archival studies in the room and library studies as well want to comment on the, the feasibility of combining archival and library studies within your student, within your, with your within your period of study. Um, when we were at UBC and we met at Green College, we met many students who were from SLACE, School of Library, Archival, and Information Studies. Now they are together in one group. It wasn't clear to me whether they, whether they took classes in common or whether they simply met socially in common groups. But do you think it's worthwhile to have some courses um, in, whether it's a school of library science, whether it's a school of library and information studies, whether it's a SLACE, uh, is it feasible, practicable, to have um, library and archival students together? And should they be considering the topic that Karen introduced, and that is leadership skills? Should that be one of the common factors that would unite library and archive students? Well, obviously, there's a huge need for leadership ability. There's no question about that. <laughs> Sorry, John, that. can you speak up with this? Sorry, yes. Uh, the, obviously, there is a huge need for leadership ability. We, we absolutely require this in the world of archives. Um, and the archival studies programs are trying to uh, groom the new leadership of the archival profession. And I think that uh, there are a growing number of strong leaders, but we need stronger leaders. There's no question about that. We are not having the impact on our employers, on our society, on the power brokers, the politicians that we need to have. And well, could you, could you have more, more of that resonance if in fact library and archive students together took a course on leadership skills and heard from a variety of people in the community, not necessarily just librarians and archivists, about what are particular needs in the community? You're nodding to that and thinking that it might be a good idea. Do you want to say a little bit more? I can't really speak to uh, an integration sort of model with, with library schools and archival schools because we don't have a library school here. Um, and as this lady uh, pointed out, I have no idea what librarians do, what they learn, um, what they value, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, Besides the obvious, obviously I use libraries and I enjoy them. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that there does have to be, I would like to see more focus on management and also leadership mm -hmm. skills, mm -hmm. maybe from an archival standpoint. But an archival and librarian standpoint could actually be merged at this, uh, with this issue of leadership skills, couldn't it? Because it, it relates to getting the message out, it relates to, um, um, telling the stories effectively of these um, incredibly mysteriously hidden resources that we call libraries and archives? 
So it's, it's part of a package, isn't it? I'm sure there are other hands. Yes, please. I'm just going to go back to the medical metaphor. The big thing in medicine and nursing and all the health professions right now is something called interprofessional education. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're talking about here is sort of the same thing. You have people with different skills, nurses, doctors, dentists, pharmacists, mm -hmm. coming together, taking base courses, getting to know each other because then they're gonna work as a team to treat patients. Well, here we'll have librarians and archivists, both professions deal with information. But there certainly could be some common ground, common courses working together so that people would know. An archivist would know what a librarian does. Uh, uh, courses on computers, courses on management. Uh, I, I, I think it would be a good thing, at least at that level, mm -hmm. because we are talking about information here, yeah. and the convergence and digital information, so. Uh, two, two hands I see back here. Shelley, did you want to add something? Oh, um, yeah, my my take on this. She gets this, the mic. She she, she, I got the mic. You got the mic. You've got You're the You're not getting it back now. I'm just going to start. Um, no, it, it seems to me when when I travel around the world that different societies value different things, and other places put a lot of a societal value on their libraries and their archives. I mean, if you go to European um, archives, uh, you can see them, uh, it's not consistent, of course, it depends on the, the country, but you can see how much money are in, invested in some of these. I mean, well, Britain uh, would, uh, the, the public archives or what, national archives, I guess they're national called now. Archives. Uh, so I think part of the problem is, it, like, we're trying to beat the drum and we're trying to persuade people by the time they've already grown up. Well, if they haven't already been inculcated, if it hasn't been inculcated in them mm -hmm. right from the get-go that this is absolutely seminally important to society, mm -hmm. then we've already lost the battle. Well, like, we're trying to tell students, you know, white privileged students or whatever, um, it's, it's too late. We need to catch them when they're young so that they know that an archives is not a scary place and a <laughs> library is, you know, a, a, the place where you get all your, your democratic information and so on and so forth. Yes. Okay. Hi. I want to focus on story, storytelling. I think we all can be great storytellers, but I think librarians or th those people who are managers may not be excellent storytellers. What, one of the things that I noticed when I moved here is that some of the, um, the reports in the newspaper lacked maps. And I thought, my gosh, if there was a map in this story, people would understand a lot more about what was going on. Yeah. I also know that because we're dealing with people who are growing up with multimedia and they're 3D specialists or whatever, that they, we should provide them with the tools to tell their stories with multimedia. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation would be to have a multimedia lab and to get uh, staff, at the, at the professors and techies and librarians to work together to inform our students and professors how to tell, tell a story with multimedia. Uh, all, one of the things I did that I think will probably work out a lot is that I contacted our Winnipeg like Free Press, and I said, I think you could use more maps with your stories. Could we, could our students and staff help you? Oh. And they are coming to our GIS day, mm -hmm. and they want to come uh, meet up with potential GIS experts mm -hmm. and get some of the maps for their stories. They also are willing to create stories around the maps that students or faculty create. So I think we have to do focus a lot more on the tools of storytelling. Mm -hmm. and, and the flexibility of those tools too, yeah. because we heard, um, actually we heard in Yellowknife about a very popular space at the Yellowknife Public Library that is called the Maker Space and the Writer Room. And uh, it's heavily booked, 
Um, it's booked really kind of around the clock. Uh, and it's a very, very popular space in the library. It can be used by a group or by an individual. But all of the equipment, as you say, for these um, multimedia or diverse kinds of storytelling would be there and available. Uh, there's another person. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Erin Ackland, and I'm the acting university archivist at the too. University of Winnipeg. Yeah. But I've also recently um, completed the coursework at the U of M's archival studies program. Uh, so to me, it's an interesting convergence between being a very recent student and yet having three staff and being the manager of a department and of a university archives, which is a fairly prestigious job. Uh, and the discussion of having a separate leadership skills class, I think is an interesting one coming from our program because we did have several days worth of um, studies based on management functions, you know, management being a primary function of archives and being very important. So we did learn a lot about the theory behind management and we did a lot of practical um, demonstrations and problem solving in class. Now, being a manager myself now, um, so much of it you learn on the job. There's a lot of HR issues, there's lots of management issues that you could not at all. Um, if, you, if you devoted 30 hours of class time, you couldn't discuss them. You just sort of have to go with it and figure it out yourself and do some research and discuss with your colleagues and other supervisors um, maybe the best strategies. So on the one hand, I think it is good to focus on management, but there's also a lot of other archival functions. So you have to balance the need to learn a little bit of everything while realizing you can't possibly learn at all. Um, as far as combining library and archive studies, again, the U of M, it's an entirely original program in Canada. It's based on the history of the record, sort of being our, our main uh, sort of focus on our program. And that contextual understanding is, is how we do archives. So we're not an information school, we're not a library school, we're not a library school with an archive stream, which sort of seems to be the main focus in other parts of Canada. Mm -hmm. So for us, um, because we're so connected with history at this department, I think it would be very difficult to add in libraries because then you're entirely ignoring the historical, as um, the historical aspect and you're, you're sort of how we conceive of archives at this institution, uh, it just doesn't really jive with adding a library school as well. Keeping in mind, of course, that in the future when you are working in a profession, you will have to work with librarians more than likely. You'll also have to work with, um, I've worked with art curators and um, museum curators as well. So you're just gonna have to be flexible and learn as you go. And, um, and school can only do so much in preparing you for that. Thank you. And in the back row, yes. Yes, please. Um, I'm Greg Bach from the U of M Archival Studies program as well. Uh, so I would like to talk just a little bit about the, the sort of digital infrastructures that are required for libraries and archives, because mm -hmm. I think they're actually quite distinct. I think that generally there's floated out there that, you know, we share a very similar mandate and we require the same digital infrastructure to accomplish these ends. This was certainly one of the arguments put forward uh, for the merger of LAC. And I would argue that if you just look at LAC, you don't see a whole lot of digital synergies uh, coming out of that institution. And you can argue that that might be the fault of the institution. So let's look at more successful uh, integrations. And you've seen at a lot of university archives, including this one, um, university libraries and archives sharing digital infrastructure in the form mm -hmm. of institutional repositories. Mm -hmm. This works very well uh, for materials that basically you want to have um, an open access policy to. It doesn't work very well for the majority of archival holdings. So most archival holdings are, first of all, if you're talking about uh, born digital materials, you're talking about a very diverse set of formats uh, that are coming in, which libraries don't have to deal with as much. Within the library world, the formats are much more streamlined because you're dealing with um, a, a more restricted set of publishers. Whereas with archives, you're dealing with whatever formats creators create in. Mm -hmm. Once these materials are received, uh, each of those formats is going to have a different digital preservation path. Mm -hmm. So the challenges in an archive of digital preservation are much, much more complicated than for a library. In a previous life, I worked at LAC 
and I worked at, on the uh, Trusted Digital Repository there. Mm -hmm. And we saw this play out in terms of the uh, mandate for the TDR around publications was for legal deposit, mm -hmm. and then the mandate for the archives, which just as a starting point was focusing on government records. And the difference in terms of the number of formats to manage between these two, basically there was no comparison. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about having to create a completely separate digital preservation infrastructure for the archive that has to be managed separately. And then in terms of access, they're very different. So the way that you're seeing institutional repositories used in universities in North America right now is basically putting in content where there's no access restrictions. And this comes back to your point earlier about the lack of difference between published and unpublished. This is only true if the unpublished material can be openly distributed. That is not the case with a very large quantity of archival material. So you're dealing with a more complicated access regime. Mm -hmm. So right now, the institutional repository model is being used for only a small subset of the archival materials, those materials which can be freely accessed. Mm -hmm. As archives acquire more and more digital content, administering this access regime is going to become more and more difficult. And it, the, the institutional repository model is not going to work. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to move more into a kind of content management system model that enables you to have layered access depending on role, identity, and so on. Um, and one last area before I, I pass on the mic is around access tools. So right now, libraries primarily use uh, various search interfaces as the primary access tool for their holdings. And this is generally how archives have been thinking about access tools at the moment. Mm -hmm. But we're moving into a world extremely quickly where this is not going to work. And I'm very grateful that other people have raised the issue of GIS-based access. Mm -hmm. Because for <laughs> archival materials, GIS-based access is going to become extremely important very quickly. And this is just a kind of interface that just doesn't make sense for library materials. Because archives, all archives, hold collections that are from a broad geographic area. And the ability to uh, parse those collections based on geographic reference is going to become more and more important as we move forward, particularly with born digital materials that can be managed digitally in this way. Now, when you put all of this kind of, all of these kind of factors together and start talking about what digital infrastructure is required, you're talking about a very, very different kind of system or system of systems that would have to support the archival mandate. And I just want to close off by talking about a very special archive uh, which is coming to the University of Manitoba to, for the university to have custody of, uh, stewardship of, which is the, the archive of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And this archive can serve to illustrate all of the aspects I've just talked about. So there's going to be a very large quantity of video. There's going to be a very complex access regime the access regime, in turn, is going to affect the nature of how much, for instance, broadband do you need to have. Because streaming video is not like making ebooks or digital documents available on the web. It's a much more complicated process. So basically, I could continue going with this metaphor and, and looking specifically at the TRC archive. Um, there's a whole series of you know, GIS interfaces uh, for the, the TRC archive are going to be essential because it's going to be a Canada-wide collection that is going to make sense to very specific communities. Yes. The, these records are, are literally being held in, in trust, in, in custody for these communities. So they need to be accessible to these communities in a way that makes sense, and maps make sense to people. Um, I could also go into digital gaming and the ways that game, uh, virtual environments like Second Life or like, you know, Mass, uh, massive digital games make sense as access mechanisms for archives mm -hmm. in a way that they probably don't make sense for libraries. Yeah. But I'm just going to stop there. Thank you very much, Greg. I think your example about the TRC is particularly pertinent and critical. Ernie, I think you wanted to add. Well, I'm going to take the TRC, but I could choose uh, any number of uh, issues. 
and a, a question has come up again in, in other of our consultations, that many of these uh, situations, issues, are pan-Canadian, uh, many that are just local as well, but many, many of the issues are pan-Canadian and need pan-Canadian solutions. It goes back, I think, to also the issue that uh, I think Karen and others brought up about leadership. So there's two kind of pan-Canadian models that people have been talking about, a federal model and a national model. And the national model is one from the grassroots more than anything devoid of federal engagement. The federal one is led federally by LAC or whomever and brings the, the others to the table. And probably there are a myriad of, 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 uh, of uh, variations on a theme. But the primary issue here is Canada has some major archival and library national issues, research data, uh, preservation access, there, many of them have been mentioned. I think, Karen, you mentioned last print, as a, re, is it a regional, is it a national, is it a, a, a continental, for that matter, issue. How do we bring people to the table to put national pan-Canadian things together? Do we need a federal presence? Is it always going to need and require federal engagement? Have we been able to do it without it, because we haven't had it lately? Doesn't seem that we've made much progress either. How do we get our, our heads and hands around these major issues that our communities have, preservation being one, but not solely one? Uh, how do we get our heads around those? We seem to be, as one, I think, someone at one of our other consultations said, we're really expert on the pieces now. We know how to do this, we know how to do this, we know how to do this, we know how to do this. I think it was you, uh, someone at UBC. We don't know how to put it together. How do we get past that? How do we take national issues and, and put structure around those that can actually come to some landing place and see that something has been accomplished? Because we're just spinning our wheels on a whole range of them today, I think. Terry. Yeah, actually, as an archivist, I think we did know how to put it together. It was the Canadian Council of Archives, and it had national funding for over 20 years. And I think we still do know how to put it together, as the recent meeting of the Association of Manitoba Archivists showed. The problem we've got is very basic funding. Very basic funding. Only two provinces in Canada have the resources, Alberta and Ontario, to continue to fund uh, network You haven't been in Ontario, Alberta lately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, but they still have the funding to, to, to uh, support professional help for net, network-based archiving at the community level. Only two provinces in Canada. I think the weakness of the CCA model was that it did not succeed in creating a truly fe federated network. It had a national presence, it had strong provincial presence, but it didn't have a federated network behind it. And the genius of it was lost when the funding was lost. So now it's kind of out there. And I don't think we can go back again. I think it really is true that it's <coughs> over. And that's where I feel kind of in the dark. Because as someone who committed a lot of her time to getting that <coughs> thing up and running um, in three different provinces, I may regret the situation we're in right now, but I'm not quite sure how we're gonna go forward. So that's why I totally agree that the question of leadership is becoming critical. We really do need a new kind of leadership. Shelley, I think you have something to add in that person at the back. <coughs> Yeah, just uh, um, one of the things that uh, I see in a divergence um, that doesn't necessarily affect um, how we interact with each other between libraries and archives is uh, the space issue in, in um, archives, uh, both um, physical and digital space. Um, so when the um, federal uh, system broke down, um, and a lot of provincial archives are no longer uh, in a position either to collect much beyond um, provincial records, like the volumes of material that are coming into archives 
um, is unceasing. Um, whereas I think with, with libraries, they're actually in a position now where they can entertain other types of activities in the library um, because they are able to, um, <laughs> Karen is pointing, no. <laughs> Shells, yes. Well, um, it, it, but, but there is some, some uh, winnowing, I guess, of duplicates in order to, um, ra some rationalization in order to um, entertain uh, more activities, uh, more some of these collaborations that CMU has has pointed out um, within the library, um, and and I'm thinking, well, okay, so now the, the federal government is saying, okay, well, we'll just offload, you know, federal records, uh, you know, uh, national collections, private records, onto the provinces and onto the universities, and I'm thinking, where, you know, where is the leadership, and what are we going to do? We're almost out of space. We're, we're one of the last ones standing. We're, we were looking, you know, 20 years down. We don't have uh, electronic space. Um, you know, the, the province as a whole is trying to, to get a big data center. So there's, there's really, um, you know, uh, some, some real uh, space uh, crushing issues. So there was somebody over was here. Somebody in this row. Yeah. As we pass the, the mic, though, what I'm mostly concerned about is not hearing about the the nature of the problem. I think we understand that. Now I'm trying to be agent provocateur. How do we make it happen nationally? How, how do you bring it together? What are the constructs? We know the problem. Shelley, you've articulated it as well. It's there, it's there in libraries, it's there in archives. But how do we make national pan-Canadian efforts happen in, in a federal jurisdiction where funding is provincial, uh, uh, how do we make it happen? We know we've got national problems, but we don't seem to have mechanisms to deal with them. Um, this is Heidi Reese again. Um, I'm glad you asked that question because well, I think you. I have the answer. <laughs> Get um, this down, Jessica. Yes, yes. <laughs> I, th I think one of the things, uh, like to go back to the topic of leadership and how um, library and archival professionals um, you know, are often managers and are leaders. And I think, um, you know, using the um, TRC as an example, um, you know, you, you take the people who are the professionals who, are, are, who, who know about the details about organization and preservation and, and all that, and what you do is you bring in the community that is most... Um, I guess, most interested in preserving that information, whether they be people who have been involved in the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, people who have been affected by it, or even people that are just, um, you know, interested and find it to be an important national issue or an important local issue, and um, sort of become the leaders um, in terms of getting support from just from outside of w what we think of as our usual communities. Does, does that help? <laughs> Is it solved? I, I don't know that it's solved entirely. <laughs> uh, Andrea, I think you're next. Oh, oh. Sorry. Uh, maybe there was someone in that row. Oh, thank you. Um, as an antiquarian bookseller, I have to uh, state a pecuniary interest in being here. But having said that, <laughs> I also wear another hat as a citizen and a, a person that looks into information, does research. Um, and quite some years ago, I studied political science, uh, a discipline that deals a lot with federal provincial relations. And uh, it seems that what has been spoken about in the last two or three minutes is a question of federal provincial relations. Mm -hmm. um, health in Canada, health uh, matters um, run into the same obstacles because of the federal provincial context. The Constitution comes into play because uh, the Constitution gives health and education to provinces to a large degree. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in addition to that, there's uh, Quebec, which has de facto and 
de jure in some sense, special status. Um, so I think um, it might be useful for a group such as this, concerns with library and archives, to look over the borders of disciplines into health, into education, into other matters, mm -hmm. where federal, the federal provincial tangle has been plaguing them for a long time, and see what best practices might be there and uh, related to uh, the concerns you have. Having said that, I want to now uh, mention a concern of mine, which I've been able to see as a person that uh, looks for and discovers uh, materials, print materials, that are not currently in archives and not currently in all libraries or most libraries. I'll just say very quickly, um, recently I sent a list of uh, 200 uh, items of uh, prairie ephemera and booklets to the Peel's Prairie Provinces uh, project at the University of Alberta. They purchased 95 out of 200, about 50% of that collection I'd made of uh, prairie ephemera. And that tells me that a huge amount of our print heritage is not in the repositories. Uh, and I make money uh, because of that condition, and I'm not apologizing for it. But I have that perspective I wanted to share here, that acquisitions is an important question. And acquisitions uh, stopped, a dead stop, at Library and Archives Canada several years ago. Um, I, collect, I know of an ethnic collection, probably the biggest in North America. That was about one third or one half sold to the Library and Archives Canada. Not an item from it has been purchased since. Now, Library and Archives Canada states that they're, in theory, buying again. I haven't uh, noticed any actual purchases among my colleagues. Uh, so I think the question of federal provincial, the question of uh, our print heritage outside of repositories is important. Um, the acquisition policies and the budgets, therefore, are important. There you have it. Thank you. Well, perhaps, it, can I just it's follow just up on that? It's been more of a, a, a statement. First of all, a thank you, because I think uh, every, uh, certainly every research library uh, in Canada, if not the world, uh, thanks the, uh, the antiquarian bookman for what you do uh, in terms of building our collections. Because in point of fact, uh, uh, you build the collections as much if not more than, uh, than uh, the library people do. So uh, that, uh, that is uh, something, that, uh, a pride that I th think you should have. And I've always uh, had a great fondness for antiquarian book people, as you probably know. Um, but it's another interesting point you bring up, and I'm, I, I probably we don't have time to talk about it today. One that the panel is a bit struggling with. If we think of the, the entire uh, library and archives, and I'm thinking more on the library side now, uh, as a very complex ecosystem, uh, the, the situation the, the, that exists within Canadian publishing, uh, within the, the book uh, trades, the trade, trade books area, as well as antiquarian, uh, dealers, uh, there are issues there that I think are important ones for our, our panel to think and, and talk about. We haven't got to that point yet, but I just suggest to you that we are part of a, that there are inputs to our system that come from the outside and certainly publishers, I mean, libraries, generally speaking, have been relying on publishers since the, the Renaissance to build and provide the, the, the products of, that, that we wrap services around. So. Uh, the health and welfare of, of publishing and bookselling certainly is something that I think we, we, we need to be cognizant of as well. Tom, oh, I'm sorry. Is it, sorry, it was Andrea first and then Tom. I, I just want to speak to the point of the federal provincial um, question just quickly. Um, the issue with the archivist uh, uh, community there just raised um, an example in the health libraries community, I'm a member of the Canadian Health Library Association, and that association um, was driving um, a national initiative, which was the National Network for Libraries for Health. 
And um, just like the archives, what's happened to the archives is unfortunately a similar situation with uh, the NNLH. It's um, unfortunately dying a very slow death. And because it wasn't because we didn't have external stakeholder support. In fact, we had very much external st stakeholder support. We had um, support across Canada through the individual chapters and, and the National Association, uh, of which the, the I am a member. Um, and we had um, stakeholders including, you know, physicians, very high level editorial from J, um, JCMAJ, uh, CMAJ, et cetera. What was lacking was a funding. They tried very hard. They had the funding for a while. But I think also too, which was a larger part, was the lack of federal, as in political, support. And it seems to me that I see somewhat of the same with CLA, that you know, we lobby at them. I'm not clear we have a lot of close relationships with po politicians who can actually speak loudly when we need them to do on various different matters with regarding to libraries and, and archives Canada. And yes, our politicians change, but we don't have that much political power and we need to fix that because that's the only way that we're going to have that value, have that voice, have that recognized and have some of these national initiatives live. Um, where was, you know, where, where was the outcry when the Canadian Health Network website, which was a crucial contribution for consumer health across Canada, where did that, where was our voice when that died? Where, where are we, where's the tombstones for all of these national initiatives that die? We should be keeping track of these, we should be getting upset about this. We should be having the political power to speak up and say this isn't right. Um, and it's, that's one of the thing, elements that we have to have in place to make these national initiatives work. So you ask about, no, we should. So I, point, I question back to you, who is the we? Um, how many of you have a relationship with your MP that you can pick up the phone and talk to that MP? How many of you work, have worked on developing that kind of relationship? That's what I was going to speak to. <laughs> I'm over here. Um, <laughs> I was going to speak to that. Um, I have a background before my archival studies days in being a political like, direct action activist on the East Coast. I worked with um, um, the NDP as well. Um, um, and I agree, and I'm really happy that somebody's bringing up the, um, the point that we need to get political and we need to look at economic value as well. Uh, governments listen to money, uh, the bottom line, economics, and we do not do a good enough job in archives, libraries, museums at advocating and telling people the, what we contribute to the economy. Um, there are researchers that fly in and that will be flying in to use, say, the TRC in this city. Um, we have um, the Canadian uh, Museum of Human Rights. We have all these great organizations, provincial archives, valuable resources. When those people come to our city, they spend money at restaurants, at hotels, um, <laughs> going out to see a band, and that's economic. That, that's, that's flowing into our economy. We need to start making that argument. And I think one of the, the, the things that we need to do, in, just in Winnipeg, for example, or Manitoba, is come together and have an economic forum um, of like the cultural heritage section and, 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 and um, library archives in general to start that discussion and at those discussions of like that you know of this is where usually you get the political drive we need to have a mandate we need to start um, like we need to pull that evidence together because we have it I know um, we, have, we need to do it better than just like uh, how many numbers that come through our doors but hey how many for example, how many books does this person sold because of our resource or whatever? Anyway, what I'm getting to is having economic forum um, that we, then taking it to the next level, going to the municipal government, going to the, the provincial government, going to the federal government, and I think that's the only thing that's gonna work. We have, I don't think we, um, people want to be involved, there's a lot of activity out there um, we just need to pull it together. And I think it starts provincially first before we can go federally. I think once we get together provincially first and everybody starts working towards that, we can start working together on a larger scale. I think it needs to start from somewhere, though. Um, yeah, that's all. I'll stop there. <laughs>
There have been several attempts, actually, by those of us on the panel to um, insert ourselves in policy-making decisions. We had invited Minister Moore, when he was then Minister of Heritage, to address the panel. Um, there were um, changes in ministerial appointments shortly thereafter, and we did invite Minister Shelley Glover um, when we had our Ottawa consultation all right. <laughs> when we had our Ottawa consultation, um, we heard from the policy director in the office of Minister Glover, and um, it was informative for us, I suppose, that he was there. I suspect that it was more informative for him to be there uh, to hear from the panel. But we are trying uh, to make inroads. I realize that it's a combination of grassroots and influence peddling. I don't think it's just one. I think it has to be at both ends of the spectrum. You have to start at the top and you really have to work at the bottom too. Okay, <clears throat> and I'm losing my voice. Um, there's someone else whose hand is up. Yes, please. There's and I think it's, there's is one it here one, two? And, and over here first, I think. All right. To the, yes. my, you're right, yes. Do you want to introduce the other person? Hi, I'm Janet Good Rothney. Um, I guess I think we need to, when we do need to get political, and I think we do need to have some kind of federated angle, but I think there's a really big disconnect between the people in this room and the public about what LAC does mm -hmm. and Even what, what they don't do anymore. I think that whole just in case question is people assume that everything's there and they're going to freak out when they find that it's not, right? Uh, I have a personal connection with that. I work with the dentistry faculty at the university. The Canadian Dental Association dissolved their library, sent it to LAC, which of course is a logical place to send all of your books, but none of that material is accessible to the people who need it now. And that's the kind of thing that I think is happening more and more, and there's no, how do you come back from that? So I think it's something that maybe when we, when we are talking to public, let them know that this isn't what you assume it is. If I can uh, in, inner certain, I'm just looking at the, the time. I'm going to make a comment here, and then I'd like to change our conversation a little bit. The, the, uh, the comment over here is that uh, we had a presentation by a very senior person, in, I won't identify the organization because that would identify the individual, but a very senior person in, an, in, in a lay organization, trustees actually, library trustees, um, who was a very... Uh, influential individual in their own uh, community uh, who said, I know all about the British Library. I know all about the Library of Congress. I've never heard of the Library and Archives of Canada. So I think that uh, tells a story. I'd like to change our direction, I'm afraid. Uh, maybe we can come back to some of these other things, but there's a very one very important issue that, in looking at the time, uh, we want to make sure that we've covered. Now, it may tend to be a little more on the public library side, but I want to make sure that all of our audiences have an opportunity to, to engage in it. And you in particular, because of the Truth and Reconciliation, exactly. I think have, have perspective that the panel uh, would like to hear about. And that is library, and for that matter, archival services uh, to Aboriginal communities, to both rural and, and urban uh, Aboriginal peoples. Um, these conversations, of course, started in the north, you might very well predict what kinds of things we were hearing in, in, in northern Canada, uh, but have been uh, signally somewhat depressing right across the piece. But nonetheless, I think we, we want to get a sense of what, what the issues are. The, I mean, we know that the issue of library service, at least, is a, is a, a jurisdictional ping pong ball. Uh, the, this, libraries are provincial, Aboriginal peoples are federal, who provides services to a, to a reserve. Uh, what happens, and this was a case at one particular uh, 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 individual library, when a young, uh, a mother with a young child came into the public library in the, the town and asked if they could get a book to read, and the young child was told he could not have a book because there was no, they didn't pay taxes in the town. And this was uh, rife throughout the jurisdiction that I'm talking about. But what are the issues? How do we break down that problem? Advice and counsel, please, uh, particularly since you've had such uh, interest in, particularly from the TRC, 
framework. Greg, I think you wanted to say something. And I'm sorry we haven't been able to include every respondent to each question, but I did want us to address the Aboriginal um, portion of our mandate because it's, it's absolutely vital and it's particularly critical here. Greg. I, I agree that it's extremely important. I'm not sure that this is the correct forum um, yeah. or even this series of consultations because the uh, library and archival professions are notably lacking in Aboriginal practitioners. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that has to change. It's something that we would like to change through the archival studies school here, but frankly, we're still in very early days of um, trying to recruit and educate more indigenous uh, archivists. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the most important thing is to start to listen to Aboriginal uh, communities and starting to look at the ways of memory preservation within Aboriginal communities. Mm -hmm. um, we, particularly in, in meetings like this, we like to sort of celebrate our own role, which is a major one in uh, you know, societal memory um, and knowledge preservation and so on. But the Western Library Archive Museum type approach is only one possible approach. Mm -hmm. And there are many other ways. And uh, you know, one of the questions that we need to be asking ourselves is, how does the Western information ecology interact with non-Western information ecologies? How can we play a role yeah. in which uh, you know, indigenous communities can have the benefit of Western-style archives without Western-style archives becoming you know, overwhelming or, or taking the place yes. of uh, indigenous memory structures. Yes. And I think How do we welcome and valorize those memory structures too within the technology that we offer? I think that's absolutely critical. I, I agree with you and the only, the only difference I would make from what you just said is that you know, we don't need to validize uh, what they're doing. They, they, what they are doing is completely valid and has we been sustaining itself for millennia. Mm -hmm. um, and I, maybe we could learn something. Yes. Uh, that's, I'll leave it there. Shelley, I think Karen. I'm, it's Karen Adams, and I'm going to comment from two perspectives. One is, I used to be responsible for public libraries in the province of Manitoba. Uh, uh, and I currently serve on the Minister's Public Library Advisory Board, so you'll probably be meeting me again. But the other point, and I was standing to see if our Indigenous Services Librarian, who is uh, very active in, in, in the appropriate community, but is a relatively new role for this university, is in the room, and she's not. So uh, I'll talk a bit. I'll talk a bit about the fact that this university is very committed and has a number of access programs, access professional programs in medicine, in engineering, uh, social work, uh, <coughs> the school of management, to, to bring students from Aboriginal communities into our community. And, and with separate funding and, and, and good supports. But the fact is we still end up talking a lot about the fact that when you start to move out into rural and remote reserves, you have poor nutrition, you have schools where the facilities are subpar and where in fact the, t the, the quality of the teaching is subpar, uh, where the likelihood of actually graduating and making it through to university is difficult. Mm -hmm. If you make it through, you may well be a young mother and you've got not just the problem of adapting to the big city and going to a university, but you've got housing, you've got childcare. Um, and and in, in, there are some very good things happening that aren't exactly what Ernie would talk about, where people would be turned away. The city of Winnipeg library system is, has a lot of outreach. The University College of the North in Thompson works, uh, they, are the public you know, they, were, they are the public library as well as, as uh, so there are, some, there are some good examples of partnerships between traditional our traditional organizations and reserve populations uh, and, 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 and bush populations, if you like, that exist. But it's hard, it's hard to say you should have a public library when you haven't yet got school. You know, there's, there are so many, so many challenges out there. And you're absolutely right, Karen. I mean, there are many, many, I mean, just clean water even. Um, 
but the, the issue that I guess I was referring to, just to be clear, was not to, uh, having libraries on reserve would be a wonderful thing. And in fact, it's happened in some place. Uh, but uh, the question of jurisdiction again, why can't native people, if they want to use a library, use one in the town that's closest to them? Why has there to be a tax base associated with it? That, and that seems to be the case in at least two provinces now. So well, it's- farmers uh, in, the, in this town can't have access near the town. Sorry, the, the, the legislative structures usually are that uh, if, if the rural municipality near the town doesn't pay for library service, the farmers can't have access either. So it's a sort of everybody's, uh, it, it is predicated in that way, certainly. I didn't see the hand, I'm oh. sorry. No, okay. Oh. okay, so oh, yes, two. And there's one at the back, I think, yeah. Okay, I, um, regarding Aboriginal issues, it's very hard to be in Winnipeg without knowing that they go on and on and on forever, but they don't seem to get resolved. So I talked, I happened to talk to the digital news editor of the Edmonton Journal about the problem. He used to come from Winnipeg and he basically told me, Cynthia, the problem <coughs> is the medias. You need to hound the media. Go to the media with stories. It's the media's job to tell the story. So I, I think uh, it works for aboriginal issues, works for all sorts of issues. Thank you. There was a person at the back, I think. And then I'll back over to the front again. Ganga um, I'm not an archivist, but I certainly see the value of uh, the question posed earlier. How do non-Western communities preserve, maintain their information? In what way we can do that? One example, I, as I mentioned earlier, I do represent the Hindu Society Library, and they brought in uh, a document that I could not tell how ancient it was, so I brought it over to Shelley, and she told me it should be, the, by the way, the research was done on that, the language is written, it was a palm, you know, uh, uh, leaves mm -hmm. uh, put together. That must be at least 500, did we say, or even could be several more years. Of course, in India, that's not at all a, a, a large uh, period at all. It was seen as uh, Indians, we are notorious for keep collecting, but we never let go of anything. So here, this is very strictly an archival material preserved in palm leaves. And there's many other ways that non-Western societies collect information. Oral so story is very important, and storytelling is important in many different ways. So this kind of bringing in aspect of other culture in preservation in archival material, I think would be very valuable. And you are also bringing in from a user perspective. I think uh, piggybacking with the other question you had earlier, the art, we tend to be looking at an organizational way of doing it rather than seeing in what way we can look at it from a user perspective. Mm -hmm. In which case then archival would be a very meaningful entity for a lot of non-Western communities. Great, thank you. And Ada, I think you had something to add. <coughs> we'll just wait for the microphone. We have an Aboriginal health collection in the Health Sciences Library, which was established in the late 90s. And that collection is not only an academic collection, it's an academic and a collection for people, uh, for patients in hospitals, for the people in hospitals, as a matter of fact. Uh, last year, it was uh, named by a native elder, and it's called the First People's Place of Learning. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes it's just a matter of thinking outside the box. Yes, we are an academic library, but we recognized over 15 years ago that we needed this type of collection mm -hmm. in our library in Winnipeg because of, uh, you know, the issues with Aboriginal health. Yes. In order to ensure that anybody can have access to some of the material, we've purchased some material and put it into our consumer health collection. Mm -hmm. If they come in, as long as you're a citizen of Manitoba, mm -hmm. you can borrow from our consumer health collection. So I think there are ways somehow, sometimes of getting around things. It's just a matter of how you decide to look at them and uh, how you broaden your horizons. Thank you. 
Well, this panel is actually attempting to broaden our horizons by these kinds of conversations. And I realize that we haven't had an opportunity to hear from everyone this afternoon, but I do want to indicate at least one way in which you can continue to be in contact with us to continue the conversation and um, to submit further observations or even a brief to the panel. Um, Jessica has kindly agreed to accept um, submissions at her email address, and it's J L. McQueen, M-A-C-Q-U-E-E-N, at gmail.com. Um, we will also be posting, we continue to upload posts to our blog, libraries-archives-canada.wordpress.com. And we will have a report of this session at the University of Manitoba up on our blog. Um, I want to thank you very sincerely for your um, comments and observations this afternoon. One person halfway down this side, um, about a half an hour ago, offered the observation, I think it's about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and how we can bring together professionals that are concerned with preserving and, and um, uh, enabling these documents to be read by the appropriate communities and the communities affected to bring these two to bring these two parties together the professionals and the communities and that's really i think what we're about as a panel you know we're bringing together we're hoping to bring together communities and professionals because tomorrow we're going to be uh, meeting with readers at the saint boniface branch of the public library we hope to um, hear more about the values placed on public libraries, but it is, it's really an ongoing conversation, and I do want to encourage you to continue to talk to us, to submit ideas or questions um, via um, Jessica's email or via a post on the blog. Um, they're all means of getting in touch with us. So again, I want to thank Karen and Shelley, yes, for, um, organizing this afternoon for us and um, and all of you for your presence. Ernie. Well, and one other thing um, uh, to contribute. We certainly want to get those briefs and those perspectives and, and send them. But we one of the things that came to us very early on is that libraries, generally speaking, and archives, generally speaking, are, a, are good news stories. And we want to hear the good news. We want your stories about how you or your libraries or your archives have made a difference. If that health collection, as someone has come in and said, by using that collection, um, I was able to find out something about what I'm ill from or something. I, I don't know what the story is, but we want to hear the story so that we can put, to digest some of these and put some of them into the report. The good news stories, what, what difference you and your library or your archive has made in the lives of your clientele. Uh, in some fashion or other. There's a question at the back. Stories and how, how have we helped individuals find information or find meaning. But it's actually, I think, from my perspective about rele relevancy and how, as a community, we can continue to demonstrate both to our clients and the people that come through our door, through libraries and archives doors, mm -hmm. but also to our sponsoring bodies. Mm -hmm. How do we stay relevant? Absolutely. They're, they are inextricably intertwined. The communication skills and the need to influence people. I think Aristotle called it rhetoric, but it's really important. Um, and I... <laughs> I do want to add one thing in closing, and that is that um, if you do um, plan to submit either a, um, a brief or um, a series of comments or a good news story or even of an issue of relevance, I ask that you do so no later than the middle of January. Tom, did you have a comment? Oh, all right, sure. <laughs>
It was on. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't holding it closely enough. I think this is really, really important that we have these good news stories or relevant stories. The good news is there are lots of them. Yeah. The danger is the readers of this might say, oh, you're doing such a great job. What's the fine. problem? Everything's fine. The mm -hmm. problem is we don't know, particularly on the archival side, how long this can go on mm -hmm. because of the digital transformation. Yeah. If we do not master the born digital record mm -hmm. and archive it, the good news stories will end with the end of the paper age. There'll be a lot of good news stories, but there won't be as many as there should be. That's the real challenge and danger, and I hope you'll emphasize that. Yeah. You've got lots of good news stories. Yes, I, I don't mean simply to sound like a Pollyanna about this. Um, I have been accused of late, but um, I, I really think that it's important for you to understand that our, our report will, will really focus on recommendations, and these recommendations can't be, um, can't be platitudes. Um, they, have to, they have to have teeth. And they will have teeth through the stories of relevance or success, even a success that is in peril. If you send that to us, I think that would be very, very helpful for our cause, our joint cause. So thank you very much. With all respect, Tom, for your last word, I do want to have the last <laughs> word. <laughs> I, uh, uh, I, I, as I've been sitting through the afternoon, I think one of the positive. Um, one of the, you've already brought us a benefit in as much as this is not a group of people that you would normally find sitting in the same room talking about the kinds of things we've been talking about. Uh, it's not a group. This is a, we are a siloed community in Manitoba and uh, uh, in, in very many ways and, it, and it's useful to understand the diversity of our perspectives and we probably all have somebody in the audience who we would like to ha engage in further debate with and correct the error of their ways. <laughs> but um, I, we very much appreciate the time you're putting into this exercise. I'm sure you're being paid handsomely for it. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, to, and and to, to extend our appreciation to you for taking on this monumental task and, and to say how much we look forward to your report and to thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs>